and thanks a lot for joining. So we have um, Professor John McCall from the Robert Gordon University. We've been working with John for the past 14 or so um, years, um, exploiting optimization capabilities in, in our operations, primarily in the field space. Um, John is a leading expert, actually, um, when it comes to building applications using um, AI techniques. And he has successfully deployed some of these applications um, in the oil and gas industry. And today he will talk to us about um, how to use AI and data science to model the complex and fragmented Nazi supply chain. Okay, over to you, John. Please post your questions um, on the chat. And um, John will talk for about 40 to 45 minutes and we'll open up for questions. Over to you, John. Thanks very much, Gilbert. So, um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, the North Sea supply chain and, uh, as Gilbert said, um, how uh, AI and data science have a role in the transformations that have to happen uh, as we move from a, a carbon-based uh, economy to hydrogen-based economy, which in the context of the North Sea means uh, offshore renewable energy, wind, wave, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so I've, um, I'll talk a bit about my various uh, roles later on. They're there on the the slide, but uh, I uh, lead a um, smart data technologies uh, group at, uh, at RGU, uh, and I'm currently seconded to the National Subsea Centre, where I a professorial lead, um, hence the strong interest in the North Sea. Uh, and I've also got a couple of spin-out companies that um, are involved in this work and will be mentioned in passing. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's no secret to anybody that uh, we face uh, increasing uh, global challenges uh, and uh, we're involved in, um, you know, society has created extremely complex systems and we also have, you know, the kind of effects of climate change and so on. On top of um, things like uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, Brexit and, uh, and so on. So we, we live in a very complex world and we're increasingly subject to um, quite dramatic changes to these very complex systems. Uh, and so a theme of this talk is complexity and complex systems and where uh, AI and data science can be used to help cut through some of that complexity. Uh, so I'm talking about the, the North Sea supply chain. Um, if I'd been giving this talk a few years ago, it would have all been about um, uh, efficiency and profitability and that sort of thing. Uh, that's totally turned on its head, uh, particularly in the last few years. Um, and the uh, COVID pandemic really um, put the tin lid on it in terms of um, a long-term future for um, for hydrocarbons, and so the the whole industry now is transitioning to um, clean energy, um, and that has that means that there's a need to kind of radically transform uh, the supply chain. Um, so by the supply chain, uh, in uh, very short term, I mean uh, onshore uh, logistics, um, taking equipment to and from harbours, particularly Aberdeen Harbour, but also Peterhead and other local uh, harbours, um, and then supply vessels um, taking those uh, goods um, and supplies out to oil and gas installations. And that's the focus of what I'm talking about uh, today. But uh, as we go through transition, um, there will be kind of um, oil and gas infrastructure operating alongside uh, offshore renewable infrastructure, infrastructure uh, and then in the longer term there's a massive uh, growth in offshore renewable infrastructure and some of these logistic problems um, carry over mutatis mutandi to, to that industry as well. Uh, so um, 
the industry drivers as far as uh, um, oil and gas are concerned is they need to reduce uh, their um, the assets that they're using. Uh, they need to make hundreds of millions of pounds a year in cost savings to even remain viable. Um, and also um, there's a very strong emphasis now on ha reducing the environmental footprint of the industry. So there's a, there's a net zero uh, carbon concept in the North Sea um, and some of that can be realised through uh, or will have to be realised through um, quite expensive engineering changes to um, to what happens in the North Sea. There's a lot of decommissioning to happen there, which is uh, a big in, a big uh, upfront um, investment in terms of uh, the equipment required to do that. Um, but uh, so but what I'm talking about today is kind of uh, kind of earlier um benefits that you can do just by applying optimization to the sort of operations that are, are happening in the north sea uh so thinking about the supply chain the kind of, a kind of simple-minded naive view of what we're trying to do is we have different uh oil and gas operators represented by the colored buildings at the top uh they have stuff that they need to get to their assets in the north sea uh represented at the bottom uh, and those assets are distributed according to uh, where they found hydrocarbons. And so they tend to be individually scattered uh, about the North Sea. Um, but they're often co-located because they're in regions where there are hydrocarbons. They're often co-located co with platforms belonging to uh, other operators. Uh, and traditionally, they have all done their own thing. So they have not um, pooled their resources and they've not even particularly optimized their, their logistics uh, because um, traditionally the, the profits from uh, oil and gas have made any savings that you can make in terms of logistics uh, negligible from their point of view, so they haven't invested in it. Uh, but they're very quickly catching up now with um, uh, um, AI and data science and are very keen to now realize um, savings from these uh, these things. So, the, so the, the naive view of this is to say, well, what what if we just uh, optimize the North Sea as a whole and regarded this all as one just pool, logistics pool. Um, so using uh, data science and some algorithms, can we just operate a kind of common logistics pool with much fewer resources and taking advantage of the co-location of these platforms and so on? Um, so that's that's a fairly uh, big ambition, and what I'm going to talk about today is a path that we've been on at RGU uh, with the industry for um, a period of seven or eight years now, uh, um, trying to move towards this goal, and you'll see where we've got to. Uh, a little bit about the National Subsea Centre uh, for context. So this is uh, a UK and um, Scottish government funded uh, centre through the Aberdeen uh, City deal. Um, and uh, it's aligned now with this um, drive towards zero emissions, integrated energy, circular ocean, uh, all those sort of uh, buzzwords that you, that you can think of. Um, and at the moment we are uh, a, a very central to that is uh, AI and data science, along with um, marine engineering and, uh, and, and other disciplines. Um, so, uh, and there's their focus area, uh, AI and data science, smart basin, and particularly intelligent operations performance um, and intelligent planning are the kind of areas I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is the Smart Data Technologies Group. So this has been going, this is now in the National Subsea Centre, but it's going for some time. Uh, this isn't everyone uh, in my group, but it's uh, everyone who's been involved in the research I'm going to talk about today. Um, and uh, a couple of these members have left. Olivier at the bottom has gone to uh, Airbus and now works as a senior research scientist there. And Maya was now a uh, senior research scientist at Fujitsu. Um, and what we do in a nutshell is um, population-based metaheuristics. So these are um, search algorithms that uh, look to optimize problems. So it's optimization as a search. So you have populations of solutions to a problem. 
Uh, and in a very um, top level term, uh, it's a loop uh, of you have a population of solutions, you evaluate those solutions, um, you then apply a learning method, it might be a genetic algorithm or a particle swarm or a estimation of distribution algorithm, whatever. Um, and that then tells you which solutions to look at next. So you update your population, you evaluate the new population, and you go around and around that loop. And at the end, you output a set of solutions that um, are good solutions uh, to the problem. Um, so uh, this is well known, certainly widely applied across uh, BT um, as, a, as a method. I'm sure there's many kind of experts in this area uh, in the audience, so I don't need to spend uh, a lot of time on it. Um, but one, uh, in terms of industrial applications, a particular flavor of this that we've uh, applied a lot uh, is um, optimization wrapped around uh, simulation. And so this, this involves the, the evaluation. So we tend to be using um, fairly lightweight um, optimization algorithms um, and uh, putting quite a lot of um, of the intelligence into simulation. So uh, we take a solution, a set of decisions, and we model the the industrial situation. So we model truck uh, operations or vessel operations. I'll come on to talk about that. Um, so when we get a particular decision, the decision then can be simulated and we can generate a whole bunch of outcomes from that. <clears throat> and then we translate these outcomes into evaluation and then we're jumping back into our algorithm. So a lot of the interesting stuff is done in here. And the reason why we adopt this approach um, uh, is uh, that very often when you're um, exploring complex um, industrial problems like logistics and so on. Uh, you don't get the whole story uh, in one go. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a process of, um, of, of peeling, the, peeling the onion, so to speak. Um, and what, you, what we find is that uh, this approach is very robust to new constraints, um, new uh, changes to KPIs as um, end users understand what can be achieved with the algorithms and reformulate and re-express uh, their goals. So if you're going on a journey, as you often are in a, in a real world application, um, wrapping up the, the evaluation in a simulation allows you to be quite flexible in how you, um, how you model the industrial situation. And it also takes you from um, uh, very brittle formulations of optimization problems as, for example, a mixed integer, integer linear programming problem or something like that. Uh, as, as you get to real world situations, those things tend to explode in terms of the number of constraint equations you have to write and the number of dis binary decision variables you have to introduce and so on. Uh, whereas, if, whereas this approach is much more flexible in terms of um, abstracting the essentials of the decision in a fairly simple encoding uh, and then putting a lot of uh, effort into this, this this simulation. And as you learn more, the simulation can change without much effect on, on, on the search algorithm. So that's the general uh, method that we've applied. We applied it a lot to North Sea supply chain, which I'll talk about here, but we've, we're also applying it in, in other areas, uh, process modeling, uh, transport system modeling, uh, and so on. OK, so I'm going to go through different uh, points in the supply chain that we've been uh, modeling. The first one's uh, truck scheduling, which we worked with uh, uh, ARR Crave in this. They're um, the largest haulier, uh, one of the largest hauliers in, in Scotland, and particular for the oil and gas industry. Their local operations accounted for about 40% of, the, um, 40 of the, the oil and gas um, output. Uh, going to the the North Sea, and that's not just Aberdeen, but it goes far south as uh, Montrose, as far north as Peterhead, which are other ports uh, on the coast. And they're also servicing 
other customers. It's not all oil and gas. It's 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 other um, customers as well in that area. They've got about um, 100 trucks, 300 trailers, and they do about uh, 300 uh, jobs per day in a typical day. Um, so. ARR Crabe, when we started working with them, had uh, a completely uh, manual um, operation, so they didn't have uh, data for us um, or, or anything like that in any kind of electronic form. Um, they managed the whole operation through a magnetic whiteboard. Uh, and so part of the part of the journey we went on with them was to actually automate their systems alongside uh, and it started off as a modeling um, thing but then it became a systems development uh, project as well um, so we basically built an AI solver system uh, but then around that we also replaced their uh, order handling uh, and job sheets really represent managing the state of the different uh, jobs that they have to do during a particular day. Um, and uh, we also took over uh, communication with uh, drivers. So they were phoning trucks before, uh, and now they, they communicate with drivers largely through the system, which I'll, which I'll show shortly. Uh, and then in terms of their view of operations, we moved um, slowly but inexorably off uh, the whiteboard onto um, screens that they use to uh, to to monitor the state of operations. Uh, in terms of the uh, the problem, um, they're basically it's very dynamic. Uh, they're looking they're they're getting jobs phoned in all the time. Maybe about, they know about thirty percent of what they're going to do in a day when they start the day, and everything else comes in uh, during that time. Um, they've got quite complex, heterogeneous uh, vehicles involved. Uh, they um, uh, they pick up and drop off trailers at different points and so on. So uh, if you look at this in the kind of taxonomy of uh, vehicle routing problems, it's some kind of amalgamation of uh, vehicle routing pickup and delivery with time windows and truck and trailer routing problem, plus a lot of dynamism uh, applied to that. So. Um, our approach is adapted. Uh, we, we've published this, but approach is adapted um, from uh, work done by Shang et al, which um, developed a, 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 a trip building, a greedy trip building uh, algorithm. Um, so this is a this is a diagram from our uh, paper on the subject, uh, but with many embellishments to account for the the particularities of of uh, Crabe's operation. Um, so what we do is we, um, the algorithm, the, the, the advantage of this particular algorithm is it's quite quick, uh, quite fast, so we can run it many times and therefore we can, we can have a dynamic situation where as the state changes, um, then we can, uh, we can re-evaluate um, the schedule for the day. Uh, so this is the... Um, uh, part of this is a simulation, so... Uh, depending on the decision that we've made for a, um, uh, at a particular point in the day, we can simulate um, the outcomes in terms of um, uh, truck utilization is the main thing that we're trying to improve. So if we look at these trips, what we're trying to do is to um, pack as many jobs into a truck as possible. Uh, and we're also trying to uh, minimize, so this is, it looks like a truck, but it's uh, th these are actually jobs taking up particular time. So we want to minimize these times, these gaps where there's no time. So depending on the drop off area of job two and the pickup area of job four, there'll be a kind of um, space in between where um, the, the truck is running empty. So we're trying to maximize utilization. Ideally, these things are completely packed. Um, and um, you know you, you've got 100% utilization of. Of course, you never get anywhere near that. Um, <clears throat> so that's the simulate. So it's so it's a it's a it's a simulation uh, with a an algorithm wrapper, um, and it runs pretty dynamically. This is uh, actually um, I'm going to show a short video here of the operation of the Crabe system that we built. So this is a view of. <clears throat> the jobs that are currently um, on the books 
Uh, the colours indicate various stages of completion of the jobs, uh, and that runs through from you know um, sending a job to a driver, uh, the driver saying I've picked up, then the driver saying I've delivered, and, and that the job is completed, and so on. So um, as I and the yellow, um, the yellow thing down there is recommendations by the AI system of the next job. Uh, or the driver for that particular job. Um, so what you're going to see here when I run the video is uh, an operator, the operator is looking at this screen, and then what you're seeing here is the PDF of a driver who is um, interacting in real time. So, well, it's obviously faster than real time, um, but uh, you'll see the driver accepting a job and then ticking off these various stages. And as they do that, that information comes back in and the system recalculates, the, the AI recalculates and may change things. Um, so here we go. Um, so you can see the driver um, collecting and then the status of a particular job will change when that happens. Uh, and then they're going to deliver to um, Waterloo Key in Aberdeen. This is just showing you, you can, you can uh, reverse things uh, when you do it. Um, and as you do that, the, the status of the job uh, changes. Um, this is just zooming in on that particular job, uh, just to show you running through the different statuses. It's loaded up. We've picked up one thing, uh, so that's ticked off. Then we pick up the next thing and, and so on. Uh, and eventually we'll get through, we'll finally deliver, and we'll say the job is complete. Um, very indecisive driver here. Um, right, the job's now complete, yes, we're done, and then that moves off the books and, and so on. Now, every time there's an event there, um, the system is uh, recording that and recalculating because, of course, trucks can take longer uh, or less time to do jobs than, than they otherwise would, which, which can make, if there was a nearby job um, and that driver finished early, the system might take advantage of that and use that uh, uh, driver to pick up that job. So uh, the outcomes of this particular project, so as I say, we went from uh, completely manual, uh, well, the electronic part was Excel and some mobile phones, uh, to um, system to a completely automated uh, system, still with users in control. So those uh, recommendations are um, accepted or rejected by the actual controllers. They make the decisions. Uh, but um, this was implemented in 2016. Uh, and uh, over time, uh, the uh, the operators have come well, fairly quickly come to uh, rely on, on that. Um, so it's a 140 user system. Um, and it led to a substantial uh, productivity uh, increase and savings of about uh, a million a year um, to ARR Crabe. So um, that's the um, that's the truck scheduling uh, part of that. And uh, I should mention the spin-out company uh, Kellerum uh, was really set up to initially to maintain um, the software over time, but now it offers uh, general um, vehicle uh, optimization. Um, software. Um, so uh, moving on now to supply vessel scheduling. Um, so now we're looking uh, offshore and there's a whole bunch of um, oil and gas uh, installations in the central and northern North Sea and also west of Shetland. So this whole sort of area up here that are serviced mainly out of Aberdeen and Peterhead. What you're seeing there is not um, vessel routes, it's pipelines coming out of the St. Berger's gas terminal. Uh, but this shows you kind of roughly where all the different uh, fields are. We're not talking here about the Southern North Sea, which is mostly gas fields and serviced out of Yarmouth and, uh, and other places as well. We're just talking about the Aberdeen Central North Sea uh, operations. So um, there are fixed, most of the installations are fixed, there are also floating, moving drilling platforms, um, but they need ongoing support. Uh, if it's a production platform, then they need um, uh, various uh, equipment, 
uh, and they also need things like water and fuel uh, to keep their operations going. Drilling is an even more complex uh, operation where you need uh, various drilling mugs uh, supplied and, uh, and so on. And this is all done by vessels. Uh, you may have seen pictures of them. They're basically floating trucks. They've got big flatbed uh, decks. Uh, and then underneath those decks, they've got tanks to hold uh, water and uh, fuel and, and other things. Um, and traditionally, uh, the the logistics uh, operations have not been um, technically sophisticated. It's manually developed vessel schedules. Um, there's a lot of experience involved in that. Um, so um, it's experientially sophisticated, um, but it's a very complex problem. Uh, and you're typically seeing utilizations of about 30%. You're seeing cargo returned unused uh, and, uh, and so on. So we, we got involved modeling this in about 2013, 2014, uh, um, initially as a student project, but then we started to talk to uh, operators and get data uh, and so on. Um, so to boil it down in a very trivial way, um, you have um, a bunch of things that need to go offshore um, to various installations, uh, and you have some vessels that you can use to do that. So most of the operators um, have their own hired fleets of vessels, um, which they hire on long term, let's say a year to 18 months. Uh, some of them even own vessels, although that's much less frequent now. Um, and then there's also a spot market for vessels. This is also true across in Norway as well, and these markets are linked, uh, where um, if you, perhaps in a very busy period, there's a sudden demand um, and you need an extra vessel, then you can hire a spot vessel. And you can see that the prices for spot vessels can spike when there's very high demand, uh, and then at all times of year it can be quite low. Um, the costs of uh, running an installation uh, or shutting down an installation are an order of magnitude larger than the cost of hiring the vessel. So as I said, traditionally, um, there's not been a strong focus uh, on um, reducing these costs. But nonetheless, there are substantial costs. So a vessel can cost 10,000 uh, pounds a day to hire. Um, so you don't want to be exposed to the spot market and you also want to limit the long term hires aren't that much cheaper. So you you, you, you want to limit the, the number of vessels that you've hired. So basically the job here is to um, uh, allocate uh, these and also uh, bulk cargos to the vessels in such a way that the vessels then um, deliver efficiently, uh, effectively and safely um to particular installations um so once you've once you've loaded a vessel that kind of determines its, its route around around the installations uh so that looks fairly efficient you can imagine lots of inefficient ones and in fact uh, what what is has practically been traditionally done is quite inefficient for a number of reasons um so uh i'll briefly uh talk about I mean, this is not a talk about algorithms uh, but um, the the problem here I'm sure many of you will recognize is um, essentially a combinatorial uh, optimization problem um, and in fact uh, one useful way of modeling this is is, is a permutation problem where you um, you order the cargoes and vessels in such a way that you then and then apply a greedy algorithm to um, uh, to al to make the allocation, taking note of what routes that entails, uh, and then scoring that. So you have a uh, and and taking notes of what routes that entails also means um, simulating the effect of that route. So. Um, how long does it take to load these things onto the vessel? How long does the vessel take to sail to the platform? What happens at the platform? And the, the behavior there can be quite complex. Uh, and then uh, what other platforms can you visit with, with these loads? So can you get around all these? And then you get back to the harbor uh, and so on. So it's about um, trying to optimize that. 
And there's a variety of optimization criteria that you can uh, go for, but um, the, the the key one uh, is, in fact, um, vessel days sailed, or if you like, vessel distance sailed, because the speeds of these things tend to be, uh, they tend to go at uh, efficient speeds, uh, fixed efficient speeds. Um, so we, we, we talk about vessel days sailed as a main uh, criteria, and what we're trying to do is to, to, to minimise that. Um, so I mentioned it was a it was a permutation problem, and uh, RKEDA is an algorithm that we developed uh, at RD, RGU, um, which is quite good. It scores very well on things like uh, permutation flow shock problems and so on. And in fact, we've um, we've established it does very well compared to uh, genetic algorithms uh, and uh, other approaches on this particular. Um, on this particular vessel um, scheduling problem. Um, so uh, I'm not going to, uh, we have papers on RKEDA if you're, you're interested and very happy to correspond on it. Uh, but basically what it does is it, it represents an ordering of things as what's called a random key approach. So it's a series of uh, floating point numbers that allow you to rank the columns in, in order of the floating point numbers, and that corresponds to ranking your list of objects or ordering your list of objects. Um, so we have a population, and it's an estimation of distribution algorithm. So what it does is it makes a selection of good things and then builds a probabilistic model of what these things look like and then samples that model to get its next solution. So the, the learning step is doing this model, and then the next population is generated by sampling the model. Um, and we go round and round that loop and, and output um, our best and pick our best solution. And our solutions are evaluated by our vessel simulation. Um, so this is the kind of uh, visualization of the output. Um, and what, you, what you're seeing here is the fact that uh, we can model quite a lot of different things in here. So we can have pools of collaborating operators, uh, or some of them might be operating individually. Uh, and what we can do is we can we can simulate a whole. So this was what we did um, on the uh, Central North Sea study involving a number of different operators. Uh, and this is um, a representation of the kind of thing that you get when you do the optimization. So you see uh, the different colored um, installations are pooled together and vessels visit those uh, and then um, and then come back to harbour uh, and so on. So you're looking to minimise the total days uh, sailed of the vessels and you can visualise it in this sort of way um, to gain some extra insight into how the efficiencies are being achieved. Um, so oh, I don't want that again, let's move on. Um, so, as I said, we, we worked with a few operators and we, we, we've, um, uh, we started off uh, with some consultancy uh, and uh, a notable one we did with uh, Nexon, uh, the Canadian um, uh, oil and gas firm, but they, 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 they're, they're now um, part of CNUC, the, the, the Chinese um, uh, National Oil Corporation, who we're still working with. Uh, and we did some consultancy for them in 2017, and uh, we have a spin-out uh, company based on trying to commercialise uh, this, this this approach. This was consultancy, and we enabled them to, uh, by this technique, to take two vessels out of their four-vessel fleet in the Central North Sea, um, saving them um, six and a half million. Uh, and uh, that was actually one of the times that we started to gain broader industry recognition because uh, we got nominated for a, an offshore achievement uh, award uh, and so we, we and we got a bit of publicity out of it um, and so that then uh, set us up we moved on to um, a broader study in the North Sea uh, and we um, started to one of the problems in these uh, things is that the data sets are um, somewhat lacking, very rudimentary and so on. So we started to bring in, uh, started to use uh, AIS, um, Automatic Identification System uh, Data Mining. So AIS is a, 
um, is broadcast by all vessels of a particular size. So not just oil and gas vessels, but anything above 300 tonnes. Um, and it's just a way for shipping to say, uh, I'm here, I'm a vessel, um, you know, let's not collide with each other. Um, so it's mandatory that vessels broadcast this. Um, but of course, people collect it. Um, so it can be received terrestrially. There are satellites now. There's quite good satellite coverage now. Um, so what you can do is you can you can obtain this information um, and you you can use it for vessel tracking. But what you can also do is to mine it to identify what voyages um, vessels are doing. So uh, we obtained um, AIS for all vessel movements in the Central North Sea um, for a period of interest of the study. Um, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that you can do with it, this is a um, this is just looking at vessel destinations, so where vessels visited uh, and spent time. So the height of these um, the height of these columns indicates it's a, somewhere vessels would stop um, within a one kilometer radius, uh, and this is kind of over the period of um, over the period of a year. So you can see that that activity varies quite substantially. Um, so, uh, and if you look more closely at um, uh, operators' data, you can see that there are different patterns of delivery, different demands in these platforms at different times of years. Um, and uh, it's driven by weather uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So, because of that change in demand, uh, the kind of standard milk rounds that operators tend to plan to um, aren't uh, are, are well below optimal um, and so there's there's quite a substantial scope for for trying to optimize this uh, okay so uh, uh, out of that uh, North Sea study um, we again kind of modeled that and uh, and, and optimized um, and what you're seeing on the left here is this is what this is the actual AIS traces or AIS traces of what vessels did uh, in that in that period, uh, and uh, there's a bit of cross traffic, um, um, but we, which you can ignore. Uh, but what you're basically seeing is that coming out of Peterhead and Aberdeen, um, what's mostly happening is that vessels sail out to a platform and then return. Um, so something like. 70% of trips are out to one platform and return, often sailing past lots of nearby uh, platforms. There is a little bit of um, maybe about another 15, 20% of the, uh, the journeys visit two platforms, but that's about it. Um, and some of these are actually explained by, not by supply vessels, but by anchor, by um, security vessels that are moving to be stationed off one platform or another. So it's actually a bit lower in terms of um, logistics uh, usage. Uh, so when we applied our algorithms to this, um, and we, we did two things. First we, first, we modeled each individual operator operating on their own, but, but, but optimizing. Um, then we got um, quite different patterns of use that, that make use of co-location of the same operators' platforms. And then when you allow uh, operators to actually pool the platforms together, what you're seeing here is it, it doesn't look as efficient, but what you're actually seeing is over the period, advantage is taken given the varying conditions and varying commands, uh, varying demands of all the different possible routes between platforms. Uh, and you see you know, quite significant efficiencies emerging from that, which I'll, which I'll come on to. Um, so using the using the a bit of data mining, we we got a lot of operator data as well uh, in, to support this study as well, as you can imagine. Um, we were able to um, uh, identify um, that there are really substantial savings possible in the North Sea, and what we've been doing um, since then is moving on to uh, actually work with a few partners to. Um, Bring the simulation that we can that we can do um, close to commercial reality. And in fact, we're nearing the end of a project which will end up with these things commercially available. 
Um, and this is a simulation from uh, one uh, operator on a, a medium week during the year 2019. Uh, so what you're seeing here on the left is what the operator actually did in that week. Um, and what you're seeing in the right is how the algorithms would direct the vessels to uh, give that um, same sort of supply. So you can see that the algorithms are making use of co-location and managing to do multiple visits. Um, so the number of vessels the operators actually used uh, was seven. They made 11 voyages and their sailing time was 342 hours in that week. The optimized result, significantly fewer vessels, um, fewer voyages, but longer. Uh, but the overall sailing time uh, significantly reduced. So if we just look at that in terms of um, If we look at that in terms of uh, reductions, uh, then uh, for that particular week, uh, you can see the total time. Um, well, this, this is this is actually sorry, this is actually over the whole review period. So we did all of 2019 uh, for this particular operator, um, and the average number of vessels they used was five. Um, the median optimization. So we ran a bunch of algorithms, and uh, we didn't take the best one. Uh, the median optimization was um, significant reduction in the number of vessels needed, significant reduction in the number of voyages, uh, and also a very substantial reduction in the total uh, amount of sailing time. Um, so what I'm going to just briefly share with you is um, a video um, put out by OGTC, uh, which just kind of sums up, this has just gone out to the industry fairly recently just in January there, which kind of sums up the benefits. Emissions reduction, Plan C solutions, marine logistics optimization. The International Maritime Organization has committed to reducing emissions from international shipping by 40% over the next 10 years. Marine logistics costs the UKCS around £300 million per annum, and current vessel efficiency and utilisation is suboptimal. The challenge is to reduce costs and increase vessel utilisation to reduce emissions, whilst delivering safe, secure and energy efficient marine operations across the basin. In partnership with industry and academia, Plan C is now close to final testing groundbreaking marine logistics optimization software. This innovative AI-based solution leverages proven optimization algorithms and software tools to streamline offshore oil and gas marine logistics, increase vessel utilization and reduce emissions by creating an online digital operational twin. Operators and their contractors can model different operational scenarios to manage and optimize operations, either individually or collaboratively. The solution also directly transfers to vessel optimization for renewable operations, such as offshore wind. Voyage optimization has the potential to reduce cost and marine emissions by over 40% due to lower fuel consumption and increased vessel efficiency. This solution could revolutionize offshore marine logistics and reduce the number of vessel days by a similar factor. With the potential to save around 100 million pounds per year in the UKCS. Stop there. I'm uh, pretty near the end of my time. Um, so, uh, just one final uh, thing that we're, we we we've recently um, started a project. Uh, we're about um, six months in uh, with Aberdeen Harbour. So this is kind of the uh, the third key part of the um, supply chain because everything the, the trucks arrive at the the keys, um, the vessels coming out of the harbour. 
Um, and we're now uh, working with um, Aberdeen Harbour Board, um, which incidentally is the UK's oldest company, so it's nice to be working with new technologies with the, with the oldest company. Um, so we're working with the Harbour Board to optimise harbour operations. Um, and there's a number of uh, linked optimization problems here. What you're seeing on the screen there is we, we're very much doing the modelling at the moment. So uh, we have a model of the harbour, the various berths, um, the depths of the water, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the weather conditions that control access to the harbour uh, and so on. So we, we're initially focused on uh, efficient berth allocation. Uh, but there are other uh, problems around that. There's, there's, there are uh, there's pilotage uh, needed to get into the harbour, and there are um, there's a rostering problem for the the harbour the harbour um, the, the, the pilot crews. Um, there's also because uh, 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 basically the, the harbour is a a river delta, if you like. It's the end of the the river D. Um, movements within the harbour um, clash with movements uh, of vessels in and out of the harbour. So there's a there's a port movements optimization uh, problem uh, as well as um, vessels move around the harbour to um, you know uh, unload and unload, um, load up with fuel, uh, have tank cleaning, uh, various various other operations. Uh, and then there's a broader uh, demand management problem as well, where um, looking a few days out and using AIS, you can you can work out um, you know vessels can uh, book ahead um, for for berths and so on. So so that's a kind of um, a broader problem. Uh, Aberdeen um, has a very is a very highly used port, so demand management is important to them to kind of maximise their uh, profitability and so on. So as I say, we're in the early stages of this, but uh, the interesting thing is, it, it obviously links up with these other uh, optimizations that we are uh, that we are involved in, and there's a more interesting general question about handling those um, complex uh, uh, interactions. Um, I won't. Uh, I, I can see Gilbert's popped up, so I, I uh, it's time for me to stop. Um, complex connect connecting system was, was is, is my message, um, and uh, uh, that um, data analytics and AI uh, offer um, have a real part to play in um, not only the energy transition tra challenge, but the, the, the more general uh, problem of how our complex systems um, um, will have to change in the light of the kind of challenges that we face. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, John. Um, just open up for questions. So if you want to ask John any question, please. Okay, I will kick off. So yeah, you, you, you are using quite a lot of meta heuristics here. And I think you alluded to exact methods. Could you give us a view on on which you know way one should go? Is is it and and the benefits of using meta heuristics in this instance? Yeah. I mean, if you can use an exact method. Uh, and it, it works in a reasonable time, then you definitely should because you get uh, the optimal solution. Um, I think I'm arguing that very often there's so much uncertainty um, and missing data uh, with a problem. And also um, my experience has been that as you optimize and as you engage with people, the definition of the optimization problem changes. Uh, and usually in the form of um, uh, can be changes to the the KPIs, can be changes to the objectives, but very often it's it's additional constraints um, and um, a, a lot of these exact methods don't play well with additional constraints because they 
the formulation blows up or um you know you, they they simply you know the the problem becomes non-linear uh and they they, they they can't handle it um and you're not the goal of a global optimum um is an ideal thing um but if you can get a huge delta in terms of uh costs or cost saved or efficiency or whatever actually that's what's that's what's important uh, to industry so uh generally speaking i i think that um the kind of uh um meta heuristic methods and so on are more flexible uh, of course you have um the more complex uh, an algorithm you use you then have a problem of um, parameter tuning and, and tweaking and so on, which is why we, another advantage of trying to use fairly lightweight, fairly robust approaches is that they're, they're you know, they're, they're there to cut through the complexity of the decision. Uh, and if you can build as much of the, um, the constraints and the evaluation into your model, uh, then um, uh, that seems to work quite well my experience. That's great. Thanks a lot, John. I know, Steve, you have your hand up, please. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, thanks, Gilbert. Um, thanks very much, John, for the talk. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm interested in um, if you can share with us any thoughts um, with regards to charging for the services for these optimization services in the marketplace. Um, you know, you're for example, you said that um, you were saving over 40% of the cost base. What percentage of that would you hope to claim um, um, by by charging the um, the users? So that's a very, that's a very sensitive question. Um, uh, ideally, ideally, you would want to um, the the charge that you you brought to be aligned to the savings that you can make you know i so we we have a concept of um from the commercial side of optimization as a service so you're selling the savings uh and therefore the you know to be aligned to do that the more you save the more you should get um broadly speaking um and if the savings are large, which often they are in these kind of resource intensive industries, then it doesn't need to be a large percentage and it pays for itself very quickly anyway, because uh, if you're talking savings of 20 to 40 percent um, and you're taking, you know, a share of those savings, then, uh, you know, it's, it, it pays for itself very quickly. Um, the vessel scheduling, for example, could pay for itself in a couple of months, uh, and then there are many times over uh, over the course of a year. Yeah. Um, so the, the 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 kind of uh, so that kind of gain share model, if you like, is, is ideal. Uh, obviously, you can be misaligned so if you say, "Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to um, charge you based on the number of vessels you have." Then you're immediately misaligned because the aim is to reduce or the likelihood is you'll reduce the number of vessels required and therefore your profit front go down so it's kind of misaligned there so it, it's a it's actually a very good question because it's um what you don't want to be doing is just sort of saying uh what you want to try and avoid is just it's a kind of standard software fee um because it's, it's the savings you're selling not the software um having said that what we're looking at is is um basically a subscription model for for these things um that, um, so. okay thanks thank so you lot. very much for sharing that Interesting. suitably priced <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks a lot Stephen, jonathan chris you had your hand up I'm not sure whether is chris there Sorry, I'm giver. Hey, John, thanks very much. That was really interesting. I was just uh, just going back to the project you've just started at Aberdeen Harbour. Do you have any idea of um, what savings you might get in a complex sort of port environment around that for berth optimization? So, um, I mean, it's kind of a how long is a piece of string uh, question. Um, experience in a number of similar problems has shown that you're looking at uh, 
you can make savings of um, 20 to 40 percent of cost. But that, you know, that's a very, but it's that ballpark. You know, you're not looking at a couple of percent, you're looking at, um, you know, a bigger chunk than that. Uh, yeah. The reason is that as soon as you get complexity, um, the way to, um, and you've got fairly rudimentary human systems, manual systems and so on, trying to solve that complexity, a whole bunch of um, shortcuts and historic practices get embedded. Uh, and in particular, the problem is easy, the more easier to, to handle, the more resource you have. Um, so in, in the guise of having things on hand just in case, uh, and that sort of thing, what you tend to have is that these industries are operating with um, a level of resource that they've grown used to. Uh, but if you were able to um, you know, use the data technologies that we've now got and use algorithms in the way that we've now got, it's all about, a lot of it's about communication, availability of information, then my experience is there's a lot that can be cut out. Uh, and the the task is to go on go on that journey, um, bringing along the experts who actually understand the problem and then translating the parts of the problem that are complex uh, into something algorithms can solve that then suggest solutions. So what you're then able to do is to very quickly generate solutions that can then be visualized and evaluated by those experts and validated. Um, so algorithms don't give you perfect solutions. They, they, they give you solutions that can be quite messy or over fussy or, or, or whatever. But when experts see those solutions, they can see how something can be done with a lot less resource than they, they would have had before, even being careful about it. Um, so it's, it's get, it, there's definitely a journey to go on uh, with, the, with the people involved. So as I say, we're in the, the early stages of that uh, in the harbour, but uh, you know, I, I, I think significant savings are possible. Great, thank you. Good, I think, um, yep, almost on time. Thank you very much, John. And um, yeah, I believe um, others um, may have questions which will get, get them across to you as well. So yeah, my colleagues will join me in, in, in thanking you, very insightful. So yeah, we will um, bring the call to a close. Sarah, is, is there anything else you want to say before we do that? Um, no, thanks very much for supporting the event and the recording will be available post event. Great. Thank you very much. Thank thanks you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, bye now.